Hey, well, I guess I'm live. Uh, it's a great thrill to be with you all. Uh, thank you to Katie Hughes and Bishop Deacon Steve Greco for inviting me to, to do a Facebook Live with um, Spirit Field Hearts. This is really fun. Um, I've seen some of the videos. They've looked great. So I hope to share a little bit with you uh, about my favorite saint, uh, John Paul II. So I'm going to be looking down a little bit to my notes so if uh, you see me glancing down, it's not because of anything except I want to make sure I keep my place. So during my talk, feel free to post questions. Um, I don't do very many of these Facebook Lives. So if um, I, I'll try to answer some questions along the way, but um, I, I've tried to get them, at least get to them at the end. So, um, so first, a little bit about me. Uh, I've worked in, my name is Patrick Novakowski. I live in Ave Maria, Florida. I've worked in the church as a journalist, editor, communicator, and um, for, gosh, 30 years. And during that time, I had the great privilege of meeting now St. John Paul II five times. If you see over my shoulder, right here, there's young me and John Paul II um, in October of 1996. I'll talk more about that, but um, anyway, just wanted to point that out. And um, so the five times, yeah, three of them were in a private audience in either Castel Gandolfo, the Pope's um, summer residence, or in the the first one was in the Papal Apartments. That's the one right there. Um, and three of them, two two of them were in St. Peter's Square. Uh, so, and I just wrote a book called 100 Ways John Paul II Changed the World. His 100th birthday is coming up on May 18th, just a mere 11 days away. Uh, so the book unpacks his legacy in a unique way. I think some of us, all of us, probably have seen Witness to Hope by George Weigel. It's this thick. My book is not. It's uh, it's about that thick. And there it is. Um, the ebook is available now at Amazon. And uh, hopefully Katie will be adding that at the bottom of this when it's posted live on, on Facebook. Um, the hard copy paperback is not going to be out until October. Unfortunately, the, um, the pandemic kind of threw off the printing of the book, that schedule threw off the distribution from my publisher, our Sunday visitor. Um, but I'm lucky enough to have a few of the, uh, the paperback versions here in my office. So, um, the 100 ways he changed the world, it, it essentially details, it, um, you know, unpacks, um, his his work and it's 100 short essays on his areas of influence how he succeeded in moving the church into the 21st century and inspiring a, a, a whole couple of generations of catholics in a very dynamic way and i wrote it really for two audiences it, it occurred to me it's been 15 years since he died so uh, high school seniors graduating this year were two or three years old when when he died 15 years ago and they didn't grow up with john paul ii they probably barely remember pope benedict so uh and, so it's for them to help them understand in a deeper way uh the, the great influence that this man had on not only the church, but on the entire 20, 20th century. And um, so that's my primary audience. But I also wrote it for people who grew up with, with John Paul II. Remember him being elected in October of 1978 and uh, grew up watching him circle the globe, preaching the gospel, and uh, sort of saw it from a distance, but didn't really live the 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 work that he was doing uh, so there there's so much in his legacy so much in his life that was was profound and world changing uh that that i think even those of us who lived through his pontificate missed a lot of it so it's it's also for you um i love telling this story because it's it's my story the story of how i was influenced by a saint and and the story of of how a farm kid from Saskatchewan, Canada, gets to meet the greatest saint, the greatest pope of the last thousand years five times. Um, I knew when it was happening that this wasn't just for me, that it wasn't just God, God's way of saying, here, Patrick, I love you, you're going to meet the pope. I knew that there was something more that God wanted me to do with that. And this book and me talking about John Paul uh, for the last 15 years is, is, I think, how God is calling me to share the, the great things that, that Carol Wojtyla did, both as a priest and a bishop and as pope. So 
let me start from the beginning. Um, the day before I was born, Carol Wojtyla turned 48 years old. Uh, his birthday is just the day before mine, as a matter of fact. And when he turned, when when he was 48, I was born, just a little bit um, younger than I am now. Then, 42 years ago, uh, in 1978, I was a 10-year-old lad, and um, and my mom said that the Pope had died. And I said, Mom, that's old news. The Pope died a month ago. And she said, no, the new Pope died. And John Paul I had a 33-day pontificate, really unprecedented in modern times. And, and the cardinals that went into conclave to elect the next Pope were a little shaken by this because they elected a guy and then God calls him home 33 days later. Um, it really set them pondering uh, the direction that the that God, that the Holy Spirit was calling them to to change the church. So they elected Carol Wojtyla um, as Pope in October of 1978. He was the first non-Italian Pope in over 450 years. That's a pretty good run for the Italians. And, and who knows if they'll get it back. But um, they elected a Polish Pope, the very first Slavic Pope in history. And um, the first... You know, so coming from a, a Polish a family with Polish-German roots, uh, my family was pretty proud of, of that day. So six years later, September of 1984, uh, John Paul had been Pope for almost six years, and he became the very first Pope in history, and, and to this day the only Pope to ever set foot in Canada, where I grew up. Um, it was very special. It was wall-to-wall -wall coverage of John Paul II. I was a 16-year-old lad, and I had a very profound dream that John Paul II came to our house and, and gave me a hug. And I was not a praying the rosary every day um, kind of teenager. And if my mom's watching this, she'll go, yeah, he, was, he, was, he had some issues. Um, but I, this dream was, was so real, so profound, that it was almost like waking up the next morning was less real than that dream was. And it stayed with me. Um, then I began my career as a, a journalist and a writer. And uh, eight years later, um, started my career in working in the church as a, a journalist and editor. Um, and a few years later, I became uh, came to the United States. I worked for a, a Catholic magazine in Southern California. Some of you might remember that called You Magazine. Uh, it was very big from about World Youth Day in Denver in 93 till about the new millennium or so. Um, that was a phenomenal experience. And then from there, I went over to the Marian Fathers of the Marians of the Immaculate Conception at the National Shrine of Divine Mercy in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. I worked there for five years from 96 to 2001. And um, my, my story takes a, a pretty sharp turn in December of 96 when the, uh, had not, uh, an employee raffle at Christmas time. The grand prize was from the travel agent that supplied most of the travel for the Marian Fathers. And it was a trip for two to Cancun. Lo and behold, the new kid won. And the new kid, me, didn't want to go sit on a beach in Cancun. Uh, by that time, I was really engaged in my faith and a great fan of John Paul II. So I called them up and I said, can I change that ticket to Cancun to a ticket to Rome? And they said yes. So I, I booked my ticket to Rome and my brother came with me. Um, if you can see the picture back there, he's standing over my shoulder. Um, I'll post that uh, and you'll see some of these pictures. Um, so went to Rome in September of 1997. And um, because the, the, the Marians are a Polish-Lithuanian order and uh, they have... A, a, priests all, all over Eastern Europe, and John Paul II had asked them to lead the re-evangelization of Eastern Europe. And um, so they, they had a very tight relationship with him, and when my boss found out I was going to Rome, he said, well, why don't you stay at our house there and do some work for us, and by the way, would you like to meet the Pope? And I just said, do you even need to ask? Yeah, just if there's a list, just put me on that list. They put me on the list, and um, October 1st, 1997, uh, I met John Paul II for the first time. Uh, also through the intercession of St. Therese, I had been asking for her intercession simply because 
when she was young, she was I think, 15, she went to Rome, she, she met the Pope, and she asked for the Pope's intercession that she could enter the Carmel and become a nun. Uh, so I knew she had done this before me, and so I, I asked for her intercession. So I met John Paul II on her feast day, and um, small coincidence, the day before was the day that the call came in that said you're going to meet the Pope. So there's September 30th, 1997, that's when the prayer was answered, and that just happens to be the centenary of her death. She died September 30th, 1897. So um, thank you, St. Therese. Prayers get answered. All right, so next step, went to Rome for the first time. And um, uh, yeah, so how, how it works is that John Paul II had, a, a, had mass in his private chapel every morning around 7, 7.30. And he had about 30 seats. And if you were a bishop you or a priest in Rome and you wanted to can celebrate with the Holy Father, you'd call in ahead, say that you clean one of those seats and, and can celebrate, be there for the, the Pope's Mass. Um, and if you're on the list, you're a lay person and, um, and there's a seat left over, they'll call you the night before and say, you're in. So um, that's what happened. They called the night before and said, you're in, come and see the Pope. So I went to the Vatican and uh, went through the bronze door in St. Peter's Square, up a few flights of stairs, through a courtyard, up another flight of stairs to the third story. And there right in front of me was John Paul II and uh, had mass with him in his private chapel. And then at that time, I was the, the webmaster of Marian.org, so I had printed out in, in, in pages and had them bound in a white leather folder, um, pages about, uh, the, the, about the work that I had done. So pages from Marian.org about Divine Mercy, about Faustina, about Jean Paul II, and his work to authenticate her message of Divine Mercy. And um, so presented it to him. That's what I'm doing in that picture right there. And so my brother and I went, had, had that great experience and we went out to celebrate. And, and from there, we parted ways. I went through Eastern Europe and wrote some stories about the Marians and their work to re-evangelize Eastern Europe. They were a great success. The, there, were, there were articles published in Marian Helper magazine and at marian.org and uh, they were a great success. So the Marians sent me back in 98. I uh, met John Paul again. I went to Poland um, and, and was part of the entourage following John Paul II around, particularly when he dedicated a shrine that the Marian Fathers were building in central Poland. Uh, so I saw him there, and then uh, in 2000, I was in Rome for St. Faustina's canonization, April 30th, 2000, just 20 years ago, and uh, had that, again, phenomenal experience and, and a personal uh, audience with John Paul II. And during these times in Rome, I would see him blessing uh, the sick people. Uh, they'd come up in wheelchairs, they'd, they'd be wheeled in gurneys, and, uh, and he would bless them. And then following them was this long string of, of newlyweds who, who had, uh, came in their wedding clothes. And, and you would see John Paul II just beaming, blessing these, these newly married people. And, um, and I remember thinking, I want that. When I meet her, that's that's what I want to do. And um, and when I met Michelle, uh, she knew I had met the Pope and she had had friends that had gone to Rome for their honeymoon and gotten blessed by him. So she put those two things together and said, if we get married, wouldn't it be great to go to Rome and get blessed by the Pope? And I said, yes, yes, it would. And we did. We did. Um, that was April 17th, 2002. Uh, one of the best days of my life. Last time that I saw him. So Phenomenal, phenomenal blessing to to have this um, encounter with greatness with uh, with a very holy man. So I'm I actually all of the stuff in my talk I already said. So I'm just going to jump ahead there to uh, how I was formed by him. You know, um, I followed him more closely after I met him for the first time uh, in the news and reading his work and uh, just became a, a tremendous admirer of his. Um, but it wasn't just me that millions of people were inspired by his work, um, his passion for Christ, his witness, uh, his personal witness, uh, putting the gospel in action. And uh, I really believe that until the end of time, people will talk about John Paul II, John Paul the Great. And, and unpacking his teachings, uh, that it will be the, the task of the church for, for until the end of time. You know, he's he's given us so much to chew on, so much to digest that, um, you know, he's um, 
I really believe that, uh, well, tell you at the end, my, my predictions. But this was the reason I, I wrote the book, um, because it occurred to me about a year ago that um, we're, we're coming up on his 100th birthday in May of 2020. So July 1st, I started writing, uh, came up with a list of about 70 ways that he influenced the world. I already had my top 10 because I've been giving this talk for about 10 years. And so that part was already set, but I had to come up with at least 90 more. And uh, that was not an easy task, but it wasn't a hard task either. I, I came up with 70, and as I started writing, the rest of them just flowed and, and it became very easy. So what I'm gonna give you today is just the, the top 10. Um, I, we don't have time to go to the whole 100, um, but I'll give you what I believe are the top 10 gifts that he gave us uh, in, in the church. And, and these are in order. So uh, how I came up with the top 10, well, first I made my own list. And then um, I have friends who are JP2 scholars who have written about him. And, and um, so I, I went to them and I asked them, you know, what do you think about this list? So I tweaked it, I added, I subtracted, and kind of tried to come up with, with the top 10 nuggets. So pardon me while I take a drink. So I'll start with number 10. Um, John Paul II was the quintessential Marian Pope. There are other popes that were dedicated to Mary, wrote beautiful encyclicals of Mary and, and proclaimed Marian years. Um, but from the time John Paul was a very young man, um, he had a great devotion to Mary. Part of that is because of his Polish upbringing. His mother died when he was nine and his father said, now she is your mother. And that uh, he probably had a devotion to Our Lady already because it, it's just part of the Polish culture. Um, so it, it's not surprising. Uh, when he became a bishop, he claimed the motto, Totus Tuus, totally yours, his, explaining his devotion to Our Lady. He had a great devotion to the Black Madonna, to Our Lady of, of Czestochowa. And he would go to that shrine in Poland regularly, both as a, a young man, as a priest, as a bishop, and, and as Pope. And, and there proclaim how Mary leads us to Christ. And so he, uh, John Paul II uh, declared a Marian year 1987 to 1988. He wrote a Marian encyclical in 1987. Um, we, we, those of you who are of age will remember May 13th, 1981, St. Peter's Square, where Mahatma Ali Aja fired bullets that, that struck John Paul II and nearly killed him just happened to be on the Feast of Our Lady of Fatima. And um, the, the, the physician said that if one of those bullets would have been just two or three millimeters off to the other direction, it would have severed his aorta and he would have bled to death rather quickly. Um, John Paul gave credit to Our Lady. He said one hand fired the bullet, the other hand guided it, and saying that she saved his life. And as a matter of fact, when the doctors extracted that bullet, he asked for it and he had it welded into the crown of Our Lady in Fatima. So when you go to Fatima and you see the statue of Mary there, uh, know that the bullet that almost killed John Paul II is welded into that crown as his dedication to her. Um, so that was number 10, the Marian Pope. Uh, number nine, unpacking Vatican II. Uh, when, when Vatican II began in the early 60s, uh, John Paul was already a bishop. He became a bishop in 1958, and he was one of the youngest bishops at the Second Vatican Council. And when it began, he was far to the back. I think that's how they stacked the bishops. The cardinals were up the front, archbishops in the middle, and the younger bishops were at the back. But by the end of the council in 64, he was near the front because uh, he had a profound influence on uh, the direction of the council, he was he was recognized as as very intelligent, very learned, very articulate, and and a great voice for reform in the church. Um, he made a significant contribution to the pastoral council constitution on the council, Gaudium et Spes, the Church in the Modern World, and the dogmatic constitution, Lumen Gentium. And he really spent his pontificate unpacking the Second Vatican Council. In virtually every talk he gave, in virtually every uh, document that he wrote, he referred back to the council. 
And, um, you know, Paul VI had a, a lot of issues to deal with from 64 till his death in 78. Um, you know, turmoil in the culture, turmoil in the church. He had started the unpacking of the council, but um, when, the, when the, the cardinals elected John Paul II, he saw it as his task to, to take the council and really explain it and teach it in a way that, that made sense, that resonated with people, that was true to the intent of the council. There was the spirit of the council that, that flowed from, from Vatican II that taught a lot of errors and took the church in a, in a bad direction. And he's, his, his job, he saw, was to right the ship and to unpack the council in an authentic way. Um, George Weigel in, in Witness to Hope said this about John Paul and Vatican II. He said, his pontificate made it clear that Vatican II was to be understood as a council in continuity with the church's tradition, not a rupture from that tradition. The church was to engage the modern world with its own distinct resources of mind, heart, and spirit. Um, so that's Vatican II. A big, big, big part of, of John Paul II's pontificate and his teaching. Number eight, culture of life. Um, he popularized this, this phrase and, and coined it himself. Um, the most popular, I guess, where he really um, proclaimed the culture of life for the first time in a, in a distinct way was at World Youth Day in Denver in 1993. He said this, a culture of life means service to the underprivileged, the poor and the oppressed, because justice and freedom are inseparable and exist only if they exist for everyone. So throughout his pontificate, he gave us very strong teachings on all the life issues, uh, respect for human life at all stages from conception to natural death. We protect all human life and we reject abortion, euthanasia, destruction of human embryonic stem cells, um, contraception, capital punishment, except in those rare circumstances, and unjust war. He also addressed the culture of life in very... Um, very strong terms in Evangelium Vitae, um, we just celebrated the 25th anniversary of that encyclical, published in 1995, he said this, The taking of life, the unborn or in its final stages, is sometimes marked with a mistaken sense of human compassion. Such a culture of death ends up becoming the freedom of the strong against the weak who have no choice but to submit. So the culture of death takes away our choice. It, it destroys life. It doesn't respect life. Anything that um, that disrespects human life, the human person, it rightly belongs to the culture of death. And he called that out very strongly throughout his pontificate. That was number eight. Number seven, World Youth Day. So John Paul II had, he was like a youth magnet. From his early part of his, his priesthood, um, he, he had gathered this little family around him of young people and he ministered to them. He went kayaking with him. He went hiking with him. He celebrated mass out in the wilderness with them and got to know young people and, and their hearts and their desires and their, their, their passions and uh, really understood very well uh, what motivated young people. And, and those friends, they became friends. He stayed in touch with them all the way through to his death. You know, at his funeral, there were some of those people from his early priesthood who came to Poland dressed in their hiking clothes because they wanted to honor him for the influence that he made on their lives. And so throughout his life, young people were just drawn to him because of his simplicity, because of his integrity, because he was just real with them. And, and I think that resonates with people, whether you're young or old. He was just so genuine. Um, so World Youth Day in 1984, um, he had a gathering of, of young people, I believe it was in Paris, and it was a great success, bo booming success. So the first gathering was in 1986. And World Youth Day is supposed to be celebrated at the diocesan level every year and internationally every two to three years. In 1995, Closing Mass in Manila drew a record number for an event, uh, the largest gathering in human history, seven million people. And I think he, either he or Pope Francis, have since surpassed that uh, at a World Youth Day event. John Paul II challenged people 
uh, young people to learn their faith and to bring it to the world. This is what he said to, to young people in Denver in 1993. Do not be afraid to go out into the streets and into public places like the first apostles who preached Christ and the good news of salvation in the, first, in the squares, in towns, and villages. This is no time to be ashamed of the gospel. It's a time to preach it from the rooftops. So he, he was very challenging for young people and calling them to evangelize their peers. Um, and millions of people were led to Christ through World Youth Day. Thousands of religious vocations, married vocations, and, and people who, who were just um, lit on fire for, for their faith. Uh, and, and of course, World Youth Day was carried on by John Paul's successors, Pope Benedict and Pope Francis. World Youth Day, that was number seven. Number six, the Luminous Mysteries. Um, in October of 2002, relatively late in his pontificate, less than three years before he died, he wrote an encyclical letter called The Rosary of the Virgin Mary, where he suggested five new mysteries of the rosary. Now, those of us been praying the rosary for a while kind of notice that there's a gap there. Uh, the life of Jesus was kind of missing. We go from, um, you know, his, his, uh, the finding Jesus in the temple, right to the, yeah, right to, to the, the last supper. No, no last supper. First sorrowful mystery is the agony in the garden. So that, that whole section of Jesus life proclaiming the, the, the gospel, the wedding at Cana, um, proclamation of the kingdom, transfiguration, last supper. Um, you know, so he suggested this in, in, in this letter and um, he didn't impose it on the church. He suggested it. And the vast majority of Catholics who pray the rosary um, said yes. And it also drew, I think, a lot of people to the rosary who had, had kind of been away from praying it for a while. So with profound influence on, on the rosary. And that's also part of his, his Marian devotion. Number five, and this is a big one, the Catechism of the Catholic Church. So uh, the Roman Catechism had been around for a few hundred years, and that was the last universal catechism of the Catholic Church. Individual bis uh, bishops' conferences and countries had their own other catechisms. We had the, the Baltimore Catechism here in the United States. But the last universal catechism was several hundred years old. So... In 1985, there was a decision that the Synod of Bishops convened by the Holy Father, uh, the 20th anniversary of the close of the Second Vatican Council, and the decision was made to, to develop a universal catechism. And uh, a lot of bishops and a lot of critics said, we don't need that, it's a modern age, what do we need a catechism for? Um, but John Paul saw it as essential to solidifying the teachings of the Council and to putting together uh, a list, a, a, a list, a book um, uh, of, of what we believe as Catholics and why we believe it. So um, he saw it as, as critical and essential. The, the project stalled, um, but, but it finally got going. And by 1992, the, the first uh, Catechism of the Catholic Church was published in French, followed by uh, English in 1994. Um, and the compendium was published later in the Q&A format. So interesting thing is that all the previous catechisms had been a Q&A. This one, not a Q&A. Um, you know, it was, it was written in a different format, easy to follow. Um, but it's a, an incredibly valuable tool for catechesis and evangelization. It really is the what and the why of Catholicism. Um, and and, I, and I, when I looked at this and, and putting it in the book, it really didn't... Um, I, I noticed that no other faith has a universal catechism. Um, I couldn't find one in, about Muslim, Islam. I couldn't find one about Judaism. I couldn't find one uh, about Protestant Christianity or evangelicals. Um, uh, the, there really is no other faith that has the what and the why of, of what we believe and why we believe it. Um, it's a unique document. And interestingly, it's published in dozens of languages and it became an instant worldwide bestseller. Um, I had friends who, who told me that they saw it in the checkout counter at the grocery store, the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Millions and millions and millions of copies of this book have been sold. So it really proved that the critics of John Paul II, who said we don't need such a document, it, it truly proved them wrong. So that was number five, Catechism of the Catholic Church. Moving to number four, the theology of the body. 
Um, John Paul wrote a book called Love and Responsibility in 1960 um, about human sexuality and, and putting that in the context of, of church teaching. And he was way ahead of the curve. If you think about the sexual revolution of the 1960s, he had already addressed it. In, in, it was published in Poland. I'm not sure it ever came to the United States until the 80s. But um, he had addressed the, the issues that were underlying the sexual revolution and um, put it in context. This is the age of, of Alfred Kinsey and all the deviant sexual uh, ethics that were starting to come into the popular culture. And um, so, and part of this too was, was his understanding of the human person and his interaction with young people and seeing the way the culture was going. He wrote the book. So when he became Pope in 1978, um, he started putting together a series of lectures that he gave in his Wednesday audience in his his, his lectures. The, the Wednesday audience is in St. Peter's Square that he would give every week. So the Theology of the Body is 129 lectures from September of 79 to November of 84, um, unpacking this integrated vision of the human person. And it was really the first major teaching of his pontificate. Um, so it's an integrated vision of the human person, body, soul, and spirit. The, and, and he said that this, that the, the physical human body is capable of giving us the meaning of, of so many specific things, revealing answers about the fundamental questions of who we are. Is there a purpose to life? What is it? Why were we created male and female? Does it really matter if we're male or female? What is the purpose of married and celibate vocations? Why were men and women called to communion from the beginning and what is love anyway? So I, I really believe that theology of the body is more important now than ever because we have a very sexually con con confused culture that is, is kind of drifted from the truth and understanding of the human person. And uh, the, the answers are right here. So uh, my hat's off to all the, the catechists and, and theology of the body teachers who are unpacking that for the young people and the older people of today because we're all we all need that that was number four uh, theology of the body number three the fall of communism in the soviet union and eastern europe so um those of us who go back to that era remember the dream team of ronald reagan and john paul ii highly recommend the book a pope and a president by dr paul kingor um, one of my favorite books that explores this uh, teamwork that that existed between John Paul II, Ronald Reagan. These men had a great kinship, a great friendship, and it started in in 79 before John, before Reagan was even um before he was even president. Ronald Reagan had been one of the the greatest strongest voices against communism. He and 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 Fulton Sheen, strongest voices against communism here in the United States. And when Ronald Reagan saw John Paul go to Poland for the first time as Pope in June of 1979, he knew that John Paul II was the key to ending Soviet-style communism in Eastern Europe and, and even in the Soviet Union. So he saw this. He was very excited. He put out a series of radio programs, uh, talks that, that he where he explored this idea of the Polish Pope and what he had said in Poland and the experience that that the Polish people had with this returning hero, John Paul II, to his native land. So when Reagan became president, um, they, they established this friendship, this uh, diplomatic connection and and um, shared tremendous amount of intelligence between the Holy See and and Washington during the Reagan era. Um, and I, I referred to the uh, June 1979 visit. John Paul II went to Poland for the first time as Pope and millions and millions of people came. And you have to remember, this is a Soviet era. The, 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 the atheistic communists were in charge of Poland, uh, which had been a vibrant Catholic culture for a thousand years. And uh, so the, the Soviet government tried very hard, the communist government tried very hard to minimize John Paul's message. And went, so they showed it on TV and they only showed the old ladies. They really didn't show much of, of, of what he was doing and saying. But millions came out and John Paul II called down the Holy Spirit on his land and spoke of, of freedom and uh, human rights and the ability to, to love God. And, and the people responded by chanting, we want God, we want God, we need God. And, and uh, it really awoke something in them that had been dormant for decades. 
And 10 years later, the Berlin Wall fell and Eastern style communism uh, was over. That was number three. Moving on to number two, Divine Mercy. Uh, Divine Mercy was key to John Paul's pontificate. It was a, a core uh, calling. He, he said a number of times that, that it was a special call from God to um, un unpack the Divine Mercy message. So when he was 18 years old, he moved to Krakow. And he lived relatively close to where Faustina lived. A few months after he arrived in Krakow, she died in the fall of 1938 fall of 1938. He started university. Uh, so he had certainly heard about this divine mercy message, but because of the communists uh, and, and Nazis and, and the, uh, the Second World War, it was very difficult to authenticate Faustina's diary. Uh, some bad translations got out of Poland and were translated into Italian. So the Holy See said, no, we're, we're not, not going to do this. It's kind of put a a kibosh on spreading the divine mercy message and devotion. Um, then in 1965, when Karol Wojtyla was the Archbishop of Krakow, um, he asked his top theologian to start investigating the, the diary and authenticating it. Uh, he opened her cause for canonization in 65, started the investigation into her diary in 1968, and it took 10 years. Six months to the day before he became Pope, the Divine Mercy message and devotion was authenticated by the Holy See. Um, so he finished his job authenticating the, the diary and the devotion of Divine Mercy and became Pope exactly six months and one day later. Pretty amazing. So a bit of background um, on, on Divine Mercy. So from 1931 to 1938, Jesus appeared to a young Polish nun, Sister Faustina Kowalska, in Krakow, and he told her that I want you to prepare the world for my second coming. And um, that that's kind of the background. And when John Paul uh, canonized St. Faustina in April of 2000, I just happened to be in St. Peter's Square when this happened, he said that from this day forward, the second day of Easter shall be known as Divine Mercy Sunday. He said that in Italian. And I was there in the square, actually on top of the colonnade with my journalism cred credentials and the entire crowd just spontaneously erupted. Uh, and I turned to one of my friends and I said, what did he say? Because I, I, I couldn't hear it, didn't understand it. And we didn't know until later that, that he had proclaimed, this will be known as Divine Mercy Sunday from henceforth. So, uh, and he also said to his friends at dinner that night, and I authenticated this because I knew a few of them who, who had dinner with the Pope that night. He said it was the happiest day of his life. So uh, he said it was a special calling from God to, to bring the divine mess, mercy message to the world. And he did that in spades. So that was number two. Number one is the new evangelization. Um, and I put it number one for, for a couple of reasons. The first thing that Jesus said when he began his public ministry was come and see. It was an invitation to get to know him, get to know if he was who he said he was. And 11 of his disciples said, yeah, he's the real deal. He is our Lord and Savior. And one of them fell away. Um, the last thing that Jesus said was, was to go out to all the world and preach the good news and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Great Commission. Now, that just wasn't for the 11. That was for the entire church. That wasn't just for priests and bishops. That's for all of us. All of us who are baptized have a call to evangelize. And that's what John Paul taught. Paul VI said that the church exists to evangelize. Now, for the last 2,000 years, the church has sometimes been ineffective or distracted and not very not do a very good job of, of evangelizing and bringing people into right relationship with Jesus. But everything that John Paul did pointed to the new evangelization, whether it was the World Youth Day or the Catechism of the Catholic Church or devotion to Mary or his world travels that took him the equivalent of 30 times around the world, uh, 129 countries, a lot of air miles. All of that pointed to the new evangelization, to bring people into right relationship with, with our Lord. Um, he, his pontificate really focused on this and bringing people to Jesus. In 1990, he wrote this encyclical called 
Redemptoris Missio, where he called for this new evangelization, new in ardor, new in methods, and new in expression. And the ardor is, is our, 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 our passion. The methods continue to change as technology changes and culture changes. And new in expression, doing it in, in new and innovative ways. And during this time of, of lockdown and COVID and pandemic, um, we're, a lot of people are being innovative in, in how they're bringing the gospel to, to the world, including, um, including this ministry who is having this Marian conference and bringing the gospel to you via Facebook Live, just like this. So this is what he said in um, Redemptoris Missio. He said, I sense that the, the, the moment has come to commit all of the church's energies to a new evangelization and to the mission ad gentes, which is means to the nations. So when a Pope says that we need to commit all of our energies to a certain initiative, um, it's up to us as the faithful to sit up and take notice and say, what is this all about? Uh, the Pope is calling each of us to to know our faith, to live our faith in a dynamic way, and to share it in whatever way he calls us to. But if you're a person of prayer, if you're a person of of of, of faith, uh, then and you're open to to God using you for His purposes, then then be being an evangelist is just it becomes second nature because. You, we, we talk about what we love, and if we love our spouse, we'll talk about our spouse. If we love our work, we'll talk about our work. If we love Jesus Christ, we'll talk about Jesus Christ. So it's a call to fall in love with Jesus Christ in a different way, in a deeper way, and to, to talk about what we love. So get to know what we love. Hundreds of new dynamic ministries have been born through John Paul's pontificate. And think of Focus, uh, Spirit-Filled Hearts, uh, the explosion of Catholic Radio, EWTN, uh, the Augustine Institute, Napa Institute, Legatus. All of these things were, were, uh, came about during John Paul's pontificate and have really been focused very well on the new evangelization. So that's my top 10. Um, I had several runner-ups, his ecumenical outreach, his world travel. I said 129 countries. He went 723,000 miles. Now, you think about that. It's 30 times around the world or to the moon and back and then back to the moon. That's a lot of miles. So in conclusion, I, I alluded to this earlier, um, I really believe that John Paul already is spontaneously being called John Paul the Great. And I, I think that name will stick. It's not an official title, it's, but it's, it's by uh, popul popular acclamation. And I think there, there's already John Paul the Great University and John Paul the Great High Schools. And I think that if we keep using John Paul the Great, that that name will stick. I'm, I'm sure it will. I really expect that he'll be proclaimed a doctor of the church in my lifetime. I believe there are 36. He'll be the 37th. Um, and I also believe that his legacy will be unpacked until until the end of time. And the church will exist until the end of time, and the church will exist until Jesus returns in his glory. And all of us who are here, with the exception of those who are under 15 years old, are very blessed to have lived during the pontificate of this really remarkable saint. So that's my talk. Um, hope you enjoyed it. I'm looking for questions. Um, don't really see too many fire away if you've got them. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, I've got tape over my screen, so you have to excuse me. And trying to find out what those questions are. I'm gonna have to move this. Uh, it just says you're watching. Okay, I don't see any questions. So if you got questions, I'll hang out for a little bit. All right, I'm moving this. Oh, Katie Hughes asks, what were the miracles that led to John Paul's sainthood? You know, um, that's a really good question. I don't know the answer. I know that one of them was a nun who had a miraculous healing. Um, but the other one I'm not, not very well aware of. I can tell you that I know the miracles that led to Faustina's canonization. They were both American, and I had the chance to interview both of them. The, the healing for her beatification and the healing for her um, canonization. What did I say when I met John Paul II? So I took my camera off the tripod. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to bring it over here and show you my, my pictures. So 
there's the first time that's October of 1997 and then meeting him in St. Peter's Square in 1998 the private audience in 1998 the private audience in 2000 and me with my missus 11 days after I got married so what did I say to him oops what did I say to him? Um, I, I explained to him the um, the pages that are showing him from Marion.org. And um, uh, that was that was pretty much it. I had about 60 seconds. And um, and so um, I just explained what I was giving to him. I was introduced as being from Canada, interestingly enough, um, and from the Marion Fathers. So um, born in Canada, but at the time I was living in Massachusetts. He said, thank you, put a rosary in my hand. Actually, I have three rosaries that, that he gave me that I have for safekeeping my relics. And um, so that was it. Short conversation, about 60 seconds. And the other times I gave him um, altar linens. It was his 50th anniversary as a bishop. And then the third time was more pages from Marion.org. Okay. Um, Deacon Steve, what would he say to us regarding the COVID pandemic? I really think that he would say to be not afraid. Um, you know, he lived through some very difficult times as both as a priest and as a bishop and as pope, um, particularly the time of the Second World War. I think he would say that we need to trust in Jesus, that that God is saying to, something to us that we need to be um, we need to be prayerful. We need to be attentive. We need to pray a rosary. We need to trust that that God has a plan for each and every one of us. Um, and I think like Pope Francis, he would be out there in the streets and he would be um, calling people to to a greater, deeper faith. So um, who is Mary to you? Wow. Katie, you asked challenging questions. Um, she is indeed my mother, you know, in, in, in times of prayer, uh, times of, of difficulty and even times of not difficulty. Um, praying the rosary is just such a great comfort. It's a, a meditation on the life of Christ, but it's also this um, communion with our number one intercessor. No one has greater access to, to Jesus than, than Mary and Joseph. Uh, our family just finished praying a St. Joseph Novena leading up to May 1st and, um, uh, you know, they, they're, they're quite a tag team. When, when I met my wife, we were discerning uh, marriage. We prayed a perpetual novena to St. Joseph. We started and we just kept going until I proposed and she said yes. And so St. Joseph will never let you down and neither will, will Our Lady. Any other questions? Am I at an hour already? Getting there. I can hang out for a little bit more if you guys have more questions. With all the confusion in the, in the church, how, what do you think JP2 would do? What would he say? How would he guide us? Wow. You know, it's tough to speculate on what someone would do, um, you know, wh when they're not here and we have another leader. Um, you know, it'd be difficult to prognosticate what Donald Trump would do at 9-11. Would he do something different than George W. Bush did? Uh, or, or what would John Paul II do that's, you know, in, in this time of crisis? Um, like I said earlier, I think he would just call us to, to have faith and to trust that God has a plan. You know, um, I th and I think he would lean on divine mercy because, you know, when Jesus appeared to Faustina, he said, your job is to prepare the world for my second coming. He said he's coming back and we need to never lose track of the fact that I, I look at I look at life this way that when we take our last breath and and our soul passes to our Lord, that is the end of the world at least for us. So whether we we die and go for our preliminary judgment or we see Jesus coming on the clouds for a second coming, for for us as individuals, there's really no difference because so we need to live with that in mind, knowing that you know this life is just a preparation for the next that. We choose heaven now, that we don't choose heaven at the moment of death. We, How we live our lives now will determine where we will be for eternity. So our, our choices have eternal consequences. And I think John Paul would probably remind us of that. How many rosaries did JP2 say a day? Steve Greco. 
You know, I don't know. I know that he um, he had a great devotion to the rosary. Obviously, you'd see him praying it all the time. Um, I couldn't tell you. I know that he prayed a daily rosary. I'm not sure that he prayed more than that. He when when he was traveling, I think he prayed the rosary more. Um, but I, I I couldn't say if he prayed more than that. Questions? Tick tick tick. Time to wrap up. I have, I still have nine minutes. Happy to stay on if there's anything more. If not, then I'll say goodbye and thank you. Um, I'll watch this thread so people that are watching this, if you wanna, if you're watching it not live, then post some questions and I'll jump in and give you my best answer. But uh, let me tell you again about my book. John, uh, it's 100 Ways John Paul II Changed the World. It's available in Kindle right now. And the links, uh, I think Katie already posted the links underneath this talk. Uh, the paperback version from Our Sunday Visitor will be available October 22nd, which happens to be John Paul's feast day and the 42nd anniversary of his election. No, not his election. That was the 16th. The 42nd anniversary of his first day as Pope. So that's his feast day. And um, and you can find out more about me at patrickwrites.com uh, or booksbypatrick.com or patricknovakoski.com. If you can't spell my last name, then those other ones will go right to that website. Thank you very much and God bless you all.